Hi everyone, my name is Keith Horwood and this is part two of the introduction to Nodal. So if you'll recall, in part one we were creating an API server for a Twitter clone known as InstaTweet. So let's go to our project folder and run our server and see where we're currently at. So let's query our tweets endpoint and we have 11 tweets in here. Great, our tweets are populated, but what do we need now? Well, we need a user model to actually associate tweets with because a user should be able to log in and then tweet. Uh, it's not good enough to just be able to anybody to post a tweet without authentication, etc. So let's worry about creating this user. Well, we can go through the normal path of doing nodal g model user and give a username string, etc. But let's not do that because nodal actually has some built-in functionality for creating users since it's something that people frequently do with web servers. Um, we have this uh, dash user flag. Um, for automatically generating this user model. And what this is going to do is create our user model in our migration and install the bcrypt package for actually encrypting passwords. And <clears throat> what this will do is it actually extends the user model a little bit um, and does password encryption for you. And we'll show you how we're doing that in a second. Let's look at this migration that was created. So we have users with an email that's supposed to be unique. Uh, you can see here um, we have a password and we have a username. Now let's look at the actual model that was created. So we see that user is extending nodal model, but instead of just being like a, a standalone line here, we actually have some methods, uh, some custom methods for this user model that uh, are in this generator. So the first thing we see is the save method. So every model has a save method that allows you to save it. Uh, now for users, um, we have uh, a special save method and we're basically saying, check if uh, every time we save, um, we wanna reference the parent save method we want to check if the user doesn't have errors uh, and if the passwords change. And if that's true, we want to run a bcrypt hash on the password and then finally um, do a safe set, so a set without validation on the password based on a hashed value. Um, otherwise, if the password hasn't changed, we just save it normally. So anytime the developer changes the password uh, when they're writing code and then they go to save the model afterwards, uh, this method right here will make sure that that password gets encrypted before it actually gets saved to the database again. So a developer could set a plain text password and it'll get encrypted when it gets sent to the database. Another method we have here is verify password. So given an un unencrypted password, can we verify that this is actually equivalent to the user's password? Okay, and we have some validations in here uh, for emails. They must match uh, something at something dot something and passwords must be at least five characters in length. Okay, so we have users, and now we can do nodal db migrate. Okay, and nodal s, and I'm gonna try something here, and it's not gonna work. Um, I'm gonna try and do a post to the user's endpoint. Let's try and do a get to the user's endpoint first. Um, we're gonna get a 404, because we didn't create the controller. So we have to remember that when we create models, we can do nodal g controller namespace it to v1 and say for user. Um, and then we get all the basic CRUD functionality for this user model in a v1 users controller. Um, so this is automatically set up for us. So now we can actually create users. Um, so we'll go to this get again. Is our server running? No. Nope. So let's start our server again. Okay, that's running. Let's do a get request and we don't have any users. Okay, that makes sense. Now let's do a post request to users. Um, Let's just do an empty post request. We're getting a validation error for email and password. Okay, so email must be valid. So uh, email is keithwhr at gmail.com. Um, let's say my password is password. And let's give myself a username. I don't have any validations on that, but I want a username here um, is keithwhr. So now when we send this request, uh, sure, Keith was created. And we see this encrypted password here. Now, okay, that's fine. Um, we ideally probably don't want to be sending that in a response, but let's look how we can modify that. Let's uh, let's check that out by actually going to the, the get endpoint. So we go to get and we see this password here in this get response. That's no good. Uh, even though it's encrypted with Blowfish, we don't want to be showing these encrypted passwords here. Uh, so how can we hide that? Well, if we go to our user's controller, which is right here, um, we have our user query. And in our response, what we can do is we can specify an interface that we actually want to send uh, with the response. So this interface would look like this. We want to send an ID, a username, uh, an email, and let's say we can have created out there. 
sure. Uh, but we don't want password. So now that we've specified this interface, when we send a request, all of a sudden password disappears. Uh, so we can very, we have fine grained control over what we actually, data we actually send uh, in an API response based on sending this interface um, whenever we respond with uh, any sort of model. Okay, that's, that's cool. Uh, now, how do we actually associate these users with tweets? So let's go back to our tweets endpoint and look at this, and we have a bunch of tweets here. We have some tweets with user ID 1 and user ID 2. So just really quick, I'm going to go back to my user's endpoint, and I'm going to create a user ID 2 just uh, so you can see something here. Um, let's do james at gmail.com and say his username is james. OK, fantastic. And uh, just to show you that you can interface on any, let's um, throw in Jill here. Uh, you can set an interface on any endpoint. Um, on this create endpoint, let's copy this interface and put it here. And then when I send this to the create endpoint, it doesn't show me the password this time around. OK, so let's switch that back to get and go back to our tweets. So now we have all these tweets with user IDs 1 and 2 and a bunch of user IDs null. So we can filter um, by user ID not null. OK, great. Uh, but we don't have any user data associated here. And we really do actually care what user is associated with this tweet. So let's go back to our tweets controller. Um, actually, let's go back to our tweets model first. And we can do something cool here. We can call in our users model. So let's pull it in. Uh, nodal.require app slash models slash user.js uh, and we can actually do a join right here and specify a table that tweet joins to because tweet has the user ID field uh, we can say tweet joins to user and let's specify multiple is true if it's an only a has one relationship from the parent um, you don't have to specify this multiple true flag but a user can have many tweets um, so this is the equivalent of uh, the Rails has many association um, combined with the ra Rails belongs to association. Now, because of the way we do uh, injection here with uh, actually being very explicit about requiring our user model, um, we don't want um, cyclical requirements here. Uh, so Nodal is very strict about being bottom up in terms of defining joins. Uh, so you should always have a parent ID in a child table and never vice versa. So tweet belongs to user, so you would say tweet joins to user and say that this is a has many relationship on behalf of the user. Okay, so now tweet joins to user, that's great. Uh, so we can do some cool stuff now that we've done that. Um, we have user ID not null, uh, but now we can actually specify username, uh, sorry, user username equals Keith WHOR. And we do a request here. And we only get the tweets with user ID 1. Um, if I put user username equals James, uh, there was one with user ID 2 saying, hi, I'm James. OK, awesome. But we still don't have the user data. So how do we do that? Well, in tweet.query, we just throw in a simple line here. And we say dot join user. This is just the class name uh, lowercase. Uh, well, sorry, uh, camel cased instead of Pascal cased. OK. so. Now we do that and we join that in. Oh, we actually get some user data with it. Um, so let's just go back to user ID not null. Now here we have a problem again, is that we have all of these user passwords and we really don't want to have these user passwords. So how do we define that? Well, we can go back to defining this interface here, uh, essentially this whitelist of fields that we actually want to show. So we want to show the ID for the tweet, the body of the tweet, uh, the created at, and we do want to show the user. So as a separate array item, um, we give an, an object with a single key, user, and then we give that an array of what fields we actually want to join in now. Um, so here, let's join in the user ID, the user username, and the user created at. Okay, so now this follows that interface. It only shows the user ID, the username, and created at, and it joins all the users successfully uh, to this tweet's endpoint. Okay, so that's um, an overview of how we would generate users and start associating them with, uh, with tweet objects. Um, and it's step one of actually doing 
user authentication using access tokens and OAuth. So uh, I don't want this video to go on too long, so I'm gonna say that part three is going to be where we introduce OAuth and access tokens. So there's some awesome functionality built into Nodal for that, and I will show you that in the next video. Um, but I hope you enjoyed seeing joins and uh, actual some model relationships here. Um, and I hope you're getting a good sense of what Nodal is actually capable of. So stay tuned for part three, and thank you very much for watching.